So today, uh, what I plan to do uh, is talk about the things in 2.1, um, which are looking at multi-phase flow, physical hydrology. But perhaps uh, in giving some background to that, there's a couple of things I'll do before. Uh, the one thing is that I mentioned that the, the class here is contaminant hydrology very specifically. So how uh, fluids are carried uh, downstream uh, with the groundwater flow as the vehicle that takes them, basically. And so that's uh, kind of an evolution from what you may have seen in 452, which should be physical hydrology, which is about the flow of water itself, and which uh, is kind of epitomized in this stuff here. And so it used to be involved with if you if you want to uh, develop uh, Arizona to uh, grow crops in what was the desert, you want to pump water. The only uh, option you have is to pump it from the subsurface because it doesn't rain enough. And so you want to know if you pump it uh, too quickly, what will that do to the, the reserve? Is it going to replenish as quickly as you recover it? And so physical hydrology is a, a big thing, pre-70s, I suppose, in understanding how to develop um, agriculture. Uh, soil physics it looks at the infiltration of water into the subsurface and its transport. And here's just one example, which I pulled out because I thought it was kind of neat, because it's something that I did very early on in my career. Uh, when I was 10 years older than you are now. Um, and it was it was dangerous to show your photo album. You never know what might be in it. But this is State College. This is Roaring Spring. Anyone from Roaring Spring? No? Anyone from Pennsylvania here? Anyone not from Pennsylvania? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all how you ask the questions. So uh, in, yeah, probably in the mid-1990s, uh, I... There was this question of uh, the Roaring Spring, of Roaring Spring as a town. Interesting uh, problem. Roaring Spring has uh, Appleton Paper Company, which uses a lot of water and gets it from the Roaring Spring. The Roaring Spring happens to be a, um, a fold, which has a compression zone at the very top of it. Uh, and that compression zone forms a liniment, which grabs all the groundwater flow as it flows uh, to the left here. Um, which is to the west uh, in reality. And it grabs it in this fracture zone uh, and sends it down to the Roaring Spring Spring, which gets bottled as bottled water, which you can buy in your uh, non-sustainable plastic uh, water bottles here. Gets used by the Appleton Paper Company in huge amounts, or did. And it also was impacted by the fact that there's a quarry on, the, on the, the side of it. The interesting thing about this geology was that the water flowing from left to right, uh, the vertical beds basically act as a groundwater dam. And so the water flowed to the westwards, it got trapped behind this groundwater dam. And so it would be a very high level within the, the water table there. And it would flow out of the page towards you along this liniment and down into the Roaring Spring. And on the left of this groundwater dam, um, New Enterprise Stone and Lime wanted to, they already had a quarry, which was down to some, I don't know, uh, 50 feet depth. And they wanted more limestone to provide for railway ballast and uh, for concrete and for road ballast. And they wanted to expand the mine and, of course, Appleton Paper Company, who relied on the fact that they could get 500,000 gallons a day out of this to s satiate their uh, paper-making operation, were nervous that that would happen. And so they took them to court when they planned to do this, went through DEP. DEP came up with a solution to do it. But we looked at it to see what would happen as you excavate this quarry out to be able to... Uh, remove the limestone, would it allow this groundwater dam to dilate, the fractures to open, the fractures therefore to become more permeable, and to basically remove the f effective dam that was existing there. So that was the, the project, so we did that and we made some predictions. Um, the decision of 
DEP as the, um, I guess is the arbitrator in this was, why don't you just go down one bench at a time, let's see if things aren't screwed up, and if they aren't, then go down another one. And that's exactly what was done. And so during COVID, maybe two years ago or three years ago, I can't remember exactly what, went back there, uh, and this is um, New Enterprise Stone Line. It used to be at this uh, level, at the, the base here, I think, as, as its initial one. The groundwater dam is over to the right, still intact. The, uh, the base of the pit, which has gone down maybe uh, double the amount, I'm not sure how deep it is now, but it's dry as a bone, and so it works. And so groundwater hydrology is the kinds of things that you deal with that, to be able to look at uh, flows into structures, uh, flows for irrigation and groundwater use. It used to be that State College, of course, was used, whoops, don't want to see that, State College, um, Bolsberg used to be on surface water. I think State College has always, in the time I've been here, been on groundwater wells. Um, and so I remember living in Bolsberg that uh, we used to go through boil water advisories because the deer used to, uh, to poop in the water supply. And I can't, what's the, uh, what is it you get from deer poop? Anyone know? There's some bacteria you get from it. But you can obviate it by, uh, by um, boiling the water. And so we don't do that anymore because all of State College uh, gets their water from groundwater. So a transition to that is looking at, we talked about Yucca Mountain last time, nuclear waste disposal. And so most uh, countries in the world have programs, US does, it's just not very active right now, to look at what to do with nuclear waste. Most of the solutions are to store it underground. Um, and the idea is to place it in canisters, which are completely impermeable and strong. So you can drive them across the country and if they get hit by a semi, semi on a railway crossing, they don't break open. And then to take those canisters, uh, take them underground into a repository, and in this repository to place the canisters inside uh, bentonite, place the bentonite inside a tunnel, which bentonite is a clay which has very low permeability, and so it takes a long time for water to come out of it, uh, and then hope that even if the canisters do rupture, the natural barriers that are in the system provide enough uh, retardation to that sorption to be able to absorb it and retardation to slow it down so that it doesn't really get out in any volume that uh, it does harm to humanity. And so that's the next step in looking at materials. It wouldn't be a problem if there wasn't any groundwater flow that would take that component from the repository to where people live. Uh, and so groundwater is the agent that does that, and that's kind of the essence of groundwater hydrology. The focus for us, I guess, is perhaps something less exotic and perhaps esoteric as uh, nuclear waste disposal, and that is to look at things like dry cleaning solvents and gasoline spills from stations and all the industrial waste that get um, spilt in the natural environment, industrial environment, and that travel into the subsurface, um, the most insidious of them, I guess, are non-miscible components. In other words, solvents that don't dissolve easily in water. They do at some level, but not very much. And gasoline. And so the things that we'll talk about in this class are really epitomized by these two figures, which I guess we'll talk about in, in more detail. But we mentioned the words uh, l apples. Apparently, if myth is to be believed, uh, dream, dreamt up by lawyers involved in some of the first uh, litigation suits of, uh, in uh, Love Canal in uh, upstate New York, near Buffalo, where canal had just been, had this, uh, all these fluids dumped in it because it's a canal, of course, and of course it won't go anywhere if you put it in the canal. And there were a bunch of lawsuits because Boeing and IBM and a whole bunch of big uh, companies that you would know of were doing this. And it went to litigation because people were getting sick in these uh, developments that were close by. And that the lawyers apparently, if urban myth is to be believed, thought that l apples and d apples sound like apples and therefore is much, more, uh, much less insidious than talking about what these contaminants really were. So l apples sounds 
for light non-aqueous phase liquid. And it just means it's lighter than water. So when you spill gasoline, which is an Elm apple on the surface, it uh, goes down through the Vado zone. Uh, it hits the water table. It's lighter than water. So just like putting gasoline mm -hmm. on the surface in a swimming pool, it floats on the top. The fact that the groundwater table is the water surface underground is no different, so it float on top. And we'll go into this in more detail, but to cut a long story short, if you let this stuff spill into the ground, it will accumulate uh, on top of the water table. It will make some kind of lens of free product, the material itself, the gasoline. This is the, the NAPL I guess it's a light apple in this case, has to be. You can see the red. And it will sit there. And so this will have a, a smear in the chimney, as you can imagine, of the, um, the gasoline, which will be left on the grains. Uh, it will be buoyed up by the water. It will slightly, this is the water table here. So it will slightly depress the water table because you have this weight of fluid sitting on top of it, which will push down on it. All physical concepts I think you can uh, relate to. It's kind of a negative buoyancy, right? It's just like a, if you put a boat in the, the water, it goes below the, the water surface and is underneath. It's not very different from that. And of course, if this was not soluble, if it was truly fully immiscible and didn't, it is immiscible, it doesn't mix with the water, but it does dissolve chemically at trace quantities. And at those trace quantities, it will dissolve into the water that's underneath it. And it will be carried downstream by the motion of the water. It will volatilize by evaporating from this chimney and come out as a vapor and travel. And so by each of those mechanisms, you could imagine it's available to off-gas into the, sub into the above the surface and it's able to be carried down. If someone gets their well water off to the right-hand side here, then they might pull out some of the water that goes down there. Otherwise, it's kind of stuck there. It doesn't move. And the question is, is it stuck there? If it is, why is it stuck there? Why doesn't it move? Uh, and I suppose the questions we'd like to ask ultimately is, one, if it doesn't move, how quickly might it dissolve into the water or volatilize? because that affects how quickly it will be removed, because it will dissolve and be removed. Turns out, punchline is that it's not fast enough for that to happen at any rate, and these last for decades, probably centuries, um, uh, but they haven't been around that long. Um, and I guess, what are the rates at which they might be ejected into the water and end up at these compliance locations, where you, you take it out as water? And the second one uh, might be something that's denser than water. And again, the characteristics are the same. You spill it on the surface, and it goes down and makes this chimney. It smears all the stuff as it goes down vertically. But now, the water table is no real impediment to it. Because if you drop this same denser than water liquid in a swimming pool, it would sink to the bottom of the pool. And just like in a swimming pool, it will stop at the line or at the bottom. Uh, so the equivalent of the line or at the bottom in a, the subsurface would be what we would call a capillary barrier. barrier. And uh, you know what capillary behavior is, uh, the rise of fluids. And so this is a barrier that has a small enough pore size that you can't push a separate fluid through there because surface tension will stop it doing that. Just like how fluid rises in a capillary, this means that the capillary diameter is so small that even with this head that's uh, head of fluid on top of it, the mass, the, the length, the height of the fluid, which represents the pressure head, uh, is not large enough to push it through this. Of course, if it was much larger, then perhaps it would go, but for, for this case, it's not. So this is the format that we look, look at. And this also, this would be the, the lens that we might think that we'd have, which would sit here. This would be our Dean Apple. And we're interested whether that sticks there. 
We realize now also that uh, the groundwater table is here. If we think about Darcy's law, that velocity is equal to minus either k over mu dp dx, or it's also equal to hydraulic conductivity over nothing times the change in head with length. You should be familiar with these from 452. Either pressure or head, you know that head is equal to pressure over unit weight plus elevation head. So we'll deal with that enough as we go through this. So for now, you know that this, there's actually a negative sign here. So that means that the hydraulic gradient in this particular case is this. And so if that hydraulic gradient is, if this is our xy coordinate system, or xz, right, as we've used elsewhere, this gradient is negative, and so the flow will be positive in the positive x direction, so the groundwater flow will be vx. And so the groundwater table slopes this way, the um, the flow of the water will be in the direction of the groundwater flow, be carried by it. Uh, but the free phrase product in this case isn't attempting to move in this direction at all. There's nothing here. But this cartoon shows that it might go by gravity, just roll down, down, downhill. And so I guess in the analog of what we'll look at today, if you think of a windshield with a bead of water sitting on it, that water will run down the, the windshield just by gravity happens to be in a porous medium, but that's kind of the same process. It's being driven by gravity in this particular case. Darcy flow is not being driven by gravity. It's being driven by the pressure here being bigger than the pressure here. And so that drives flow, and we can characterize it in terms of a head. So that's kind of where we go. And it turns out that looking at these multi-phase flow problems is perhaps the most difficult form of problem we can deal with. And so it covers all the other things that we'll look at. The other thing I was going to show is this. I think this, I don't use movies very much in this class, but I have a few. So uh, let's go. What did I do? Well, I guess I can do it. This is the, um, a movie just of uh, a Dean Apple in a porous medium. The red is the Dean Apple being spilt from something. Uh, the blue is the water, and the purple is the Capri saturated zone on top of that. And you see, as a result of this, the Dean Apple falls like a rock. It hits the Capri barrier. It travels along the Capri barrier by gravity, just like water down a windshield or Dean Apple down a windshield. But the plume, the, the light red stuff to the right, is being carried by the groundwater. And so that's kind of the, the deal there. Uh, well, I don't want to do that. I guess, I, how do I get back? I guess I had another one. And so the corollary of that for fractured rocks, I guess, would be nothing much different. But if you spill it into fractured rocks, uh, which are perhaps more challenging than porous media, then it grows down the fractures, which have much larger di apertures, capillary apertures, and therefore can travel more readily down these. Uh, and will preferentially go f quickly down these fractures. It won't go down all of them. Uh, it'll go down some of them. And so you could imagine in this particular case, I guess, uh, one, you don't know which fractures it's going down. Two, you don't know what the fracture network looks like in the subsurface, so you're blind because it's below the subsurface. Um, three, if you drilled a hole down here vertically, uh, if you put it in the wrong place, you have no appreciation of exactly what the fracture network is, and so it doesn't um, inform you much about what's going to go on. So Dean Apples in both of these cases, maybe this is more challenging than the other case because you just don't know where it's going. But once it gets into some underlying porous medium, perhaps it's not so likely that you have porous medium under fractures. You'd expect fractures to keep on going, but it gets carried downstream in the same way by the motion of the, uh, the traveling groundwater flow.
So that's kind of the, the problem that we're going to deal with. Um, I, this is superfluous, so I won't go through that. I will mention one thing. So the, the one thing is that today uh, your homework will become live. And I just want to give you one piece of, you can pick this up as well, but I'll give you one piece of information that sometimes I go through on the first class, but I didn't last time. And that is, uh, actually it's, it's here, this primer. And so this is your Darcy's Law primer. And so if you cast your 452, it's a spring class as well. Did you take that a year ago? Yeah. Uh, so you know what Darcy's Law is. It defines Darcy velocity, which we just talked about, which is the product of a hydraulic conductivity. This is length over time, typically meters a second. This is head, which is a length. This is a length. Hydraulic head gradient is dimensionless. And this, by definition, if you work through units, is equal to is in a velocity in meters per second. This is the bulk velocity. So that if you multiply uh, in the core, if you had a core, that's pretty good. I guess I'm going to get bogged down in this and say more than I want to. So if you take the area of this core and you multiply that by the Darcy velocity, you get a volumetric flow rate. And that's useful because it gives you the volume of fluid that's coming out of it. But if you think about that, the end of that face, uh, you can think of it just as a whole bunch of grains and the space between the grains. And so the porosity of that, which in this class we'll call n, is equal to the area of the voids, or the volume. The volume of voids and the volume total, which is also the same as the area of the voids over the area total. So in other words, if you looked at this section, uh, and actually it's perhaps e easier to think about it, if you centrifuge it, so you could centrifuge all the grains into one place, then you'd have an area, this would be the area of the voids, this would be the area of the solids, and the total area would be the area total, which would equal to the area of the voids plus the area of solids. Yeah, you know, I think you know this. But my way of saying that is that if the flow is only occurring in this area of the voids, then if you're squeezing that big volume of water down there and it's only going through this bit small area, then the actual velocity of a particle of water going downstream is going to be magnified by the porosity. So if you want the advective velocity, the speed that contaminant is carried downstream, you can think of it as a molecule of the water in the flow being carried downstream, then it's equal to this Darcy velocity divided through by the porosity. So the porosity is 10%, it's going 10 times faster than Darcy's law would tell you. Uh, if it's 5%, um, it's going 20 times faster, etc. And so that's important. So your first assignment, should you choose to take it, what's that from? Mission Impossible? Oh, you know that? Come on, that's, eight, that's ages ago. I barely know that. Good for you. <laughs> oh, you guys are so smart. So if you want to calculate the rate at which stuff goes down, stream, you need to use the advective velocity. And so you can just use velocity, advective, is equal to length over time. If you want to know how long it takes to go a given length, you just rearrange that as time. Control Z. Time is equal to length over advective velocity, or length traveled in a given time is advective velocity times time. So those are the two things that you might want to, if you haven't seen before, then it puts you on the same page. 
for dealing with the uh, first assignment. And the first assignment is just saying, here's Yucca Mountain, town of Long Streets, 50 kilometers down gradient, and is a compliance location. Canister breaks in Yucca Mountain, how long does it take for uh, stuff to arrive in Long Street? And what is its potential concentration if you look at a bunch of different permeability distributions? And so if you look at these things up here, so if you look at being at Long Street and the canister breaks, then the, the residence time distribution you'd expect to see would that you'd wait for the particles to arrive closer and closer to you until they get to you. And then all of a sudden as they hit you, if it's a plug distribution that's arriving, it would jump up to the concentration they were released at. And so you could imagine that the, the residence time distribution would look something like this. So, so you're, you're all set for that. that. That's the only information you need to do. And you just need to think a little bit about the, the question. So if you know what the parameters are for the aquifer in terms of its hydraulic conductivity or permeability, if you know permeability, which is in meters squared, or you know hydraulic conductivity, which is in meters per second, you can move between them. You know this is dynamic viscosity. You know for water, it's 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, roughly. You probably know the density of water is 1,000 kilograms cubic meter, and gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, or less I in this class as well. Not sure why all the, why the U.S. isn't doing that generally, but we're not. So that's kind of the, the preamble, 25-minute preamble. So the stuff we'll talk about, we talked a little bit about what uh, L-napples and D-napples are, so we know those. And what we're interested in is the fact that they don't dissolve in water. A salad shaker uh, always has oil and water present in them as two phases. You can make it into globules and bubbles, but they'll always remain separate and they will separate. And so we'll talk about multi-phase flow. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of interfacial behavior in controlling that. We'll look at how it behaves on surfaces, like a windshield, or grains in porous media, which is how one goes into the other. And then we'll talk about describing porous media as an analog to a single capillary, which you can put in water, and water will rise, and how that relates to both contacting grains and a fracture. So that's kind of the stuff we'll, we'll cover. Seen this figure before, perhaps I won't uh, talk about it again. You can imagine that this is what we're interested in, this plume that develops from them. Um, we're interested in the realities of this behavior, and so I don't want to go through that now but talk a little bit about the physics of what we're doing. So the other thing in standing back from this class, we talked about the, the different topics. So the first part is to talk about the miscible flow. The second part is to talk about dissolved flow as it's carried downstream in the groundwater flow and uh, to talk about flow in the Vado zone. So all of those, we're talking about the physics of what's going on in the porous medium to understand how the behavior is occurring. The end of that, we'll talk about modeling, one, one period. The next couple of weeks, we'll talk about how you do site characterization to figure out what those parameters are. And then you'll, t you'll do your remediation stuff to be able to see how your understanding of that physics and the parameters that control that physics fit into understanding how you choose remediation methods, kind of the, the flow of this class. So the first topic uh, is topic two to talk about immiscible flow. And so the idea is that uh, defining the difference between miscible displacement and immiscible displacement. Miscible displacement means that you take um, a beaker of water and you drop ink in that water. And if you look at the profile that goes across that beaker and you look at the concentration of um, ink as you go across the beaker, you'd see that there's a skyscraper in the middle. So it's 100% ink where the ink was. And when you go off to the side, there's zero concentration of ink in the rest of the water. If you leave it there, um, the distribution, because of Fick's law, 
will give you this mound, which will be diffusion acting outwards. And ultimately, if you come back a long time later, the distribution will be not quite zero concentration, because there's some ink in it, but very close to it and homogeneous. So that's not what we're talking about now. That's what we're talking about in part three. We're in two right now. Immiscible displacement is where it con contains, stays exactly the same as the skyscraper all the time. It doesn't mix. Exists as a bubble, which we might think, or as we've talked about in the L-Napples and D-Napple pictures, it spreads itself out over a surface. And that surface, I guess, could be two things. It could be a capital capillary barrier in the bottom of the Dean apple, which is like dropping solvent on a windshield and seeing it move down, um, or dropping it on the top of a, a, a swimming pool uh, where it's buoyed by the water, which would be for an Eln apple. So, so we'll talk about immiscible behavior. We need to define some things. Uh, I guess we've already defined something. We've already de defined porosity. Porosity is equal to the volume of voids divided by the total volume. So in other words, you take a, well, actually we drew it already, right? You take a sample and you centrifuge, centrifuge it so you have volume of voids, volume of solid, just so we don't confuse velocities and, and the volume total. So that's porosity. The saturation is defined as the volume of fluid divided by the volume of voids. So you can think of it how much of this void volume is filled up. When the saturation uh, of water is equal to 1, that means 100% of this zone is filled up with water. If the saturation of water is equal to zero, that means this is the saturation of air has to be one, has to be filled with air. And I guess conversely, the air saturation would be equal to zero. And so we can talk about the saturation. We could have more than two fluids as well. We could have air, water, and napple. But what we do know is that because it's filling this space, they all have to add up to 100% saturation. So that's what this says. The sum of the saturations are equal to 1. So you can imagine that the saturation of water plus the saturation of air plus the saturation of, I don't know what we're going to call it, the napple, they have to equal 1. A bit complicated if you have all three, but if you have two, the two of them have to add to one. If you have one, that has to add to one. It is one as well. Uh, sometimes, do any of you take a, a soil physics class? Some students used to take a soil physics class parallel with this. No? In agronomy, they talk in terms of saturations, but define it in terms of a volumetric moisture content. And the volumetric moisture content is equal to the volume of water divided by the total volume. So not just this little uh, semicircle, uh, truncated semicircle. It's the volume of water related to the total volume. So I suppose if the volume, if it's saturated, then the volume of water um, is equal to the porosity times the total volume, I guess. Yeah, you can work that out. So it's done in terms of uh, the volume of water related to the total volume, not the volume of water related to the void volume. And so for that reason, so 100% saturation, saturation equals 1, gives a volumetric moisture content, which was equal to the porosity, right? So if this is 100% water filled here, then which would be a saturation of 1, then the volumetric uh, moisture content would be equal to just the porosity by definition. And people who do soil mechanics define moisture content as by weight percentages. And so you just have to be aware that different disciplines which have grown up in parallel, not realizing they existed actually, 
but now realize they exist, have different nomenclatures to go with them. We'll use this typically. We'll use saturation primarily. Uh, so, fine. And so our interest is in being able to look at this. I have a much better picture. Actually, it's in this. So, my whole life is on here. And I'm looking for this. This is a good picture. Has stuff from last year on it. But perhaps I'll leave that stuff on it. You don't have this, but perhaps you can uh, see what's going on. So you see glass beads, a whole bunch of small marbles. Uh, they change size from the top to the bottom, much smaller. The red is a, a non-aqueous phase liquid. They're water saturated otherwise. The non-aqueous phase liquid red has displaced the other fluid that's there. You can imagine that the, this red stuff would be 100% red saturated and this other stuff would be 100% clear saturated. Almost certainly this stuff is 100% clear saturated, but it's, uh, we're going to find out, I guess, that the red stuff isn't necessarily 100% red saturated. And that is because some of the water that was previously in here that was displaced by the advancing red fluid, the solvent, the non-aqueous phase liquid, is still left in there even as the solvent invades the pore space. And so what we'd like to do is understand what are the conditions that allow the solvent to get the red fluid, non-aqueous fluid, sounds so long-winded, the non-aqueous fluid to get into this large pore space or large diameter pore material, but it doesn't allow it to go beyond that. And so that's kind of a key question that we might want to ask ourselves. The fact that we saw this idea of a capillary barrier. Dean Apple goes down, hits the water table, keeps on going, uh, but hits this barrier which has small pores in it. And I suppose that's analogous to this. It's just not quite as stark as you could imagine. But actually, you can hopefully, yeah, you can see this kind of mottled uh, feeling here. That means if, if it's not so clear, the individual grains look like this, and the pores are what are between those grains. And so I suppose we'd like to know what controls whether it goes beyond this line or not. You can see that there's a little finger that's gone beyond it, but in most of it, it's not. And so what are the conditions that have made it go down here and not really go down here? Uh, and just understand that process. So that's the first thing that perhaps we have to, uh, to understand. And so based on that, yeah, so these are all... Uh, some experiments. These are black and white pictures, not so clear, but as kind of a zoom in. These are little beads and there are, are rings of fluid around it. This is a kind of same idea. This black thing is uh, the non-aqueous fluid uh, that's traveling and it hasn't invaded the water that's around it. And that's what we'd like to understand. And here are streaks of this uh, solvent that are being dropped in an aquarium that's filled with sand. And it's made these streaks of transport that means this has traveled really quickly and directly down vertically. But there are still portions where it hasn't touched. It's fingered as it's gone down here. And we'd like to understand some of those things. And here it's hit uh, a water table. Uh, again, it must be a Dean apple if it's below the water table already. And it's uh, spread out because of the effects of this thing. So these were experiments done in the 1970s by a guy called Schwiele to try and understand, in Germany to try and understand exactly what's going on. So we can imagine this behavior is being controlled by um, the interfacial properties. And so that's why we deal with capillary behavior in 303. Um, we could, if we wanted to, understand Dupre's formula. I don't think we need to. But it merely says that if you have two fluids which are in contact with each other, and you pull them apart so that you vaporize those fluids. And between those fluids, there's a mixed vapor of those two fluids because just like a boiling in water, vapor that comes off water is a bubble of water, which is the vapor in contact with itself. This happens to be two fluids that are pulled apart. Then the work that you have to apply to pull them apart is equal to the interfacial tension of fluid I plus fluid K minus the interfacial tension, the surface tension of those fluids minus the interfacial tension between them. You'll never use it in this class, 
but that's a definition. So perhaps we put that down. But what we're more interested in is the interaction of these liquids with other liquids and with solids. So the first one is to think about a liquid. Think about a swimming pool. You drop this non-aqueous fluid on top of the water in the, in the swimming pool. And if you look at the edge of that lens that sits on top of the swimming pool, you can look at resolving forces. Uh, and it's not particularly pragmatic, but you could imagine resolving forces at this triple point. So this is the lens of liquid B. Liquid B must be lighter, less dense than liquid A, because it's sitting on top of it. And above liquid B and above liquid A, you can think of this water, this is gasoline, and this is uh, air. Then between these three fluids, they meet in some kind of triple point. You can imagine that there's interfacial forces acting in each of these directions. And if you do a force balance from left to right, horizontally at this point, this point here, then you can say that the, f the, the force acting in this direction, AG, is, has to be equal or less equal, uh, less than the two forces from these two limbs acting in the other direction. If it's less than this, it'll exist as a lens. There'll be a little bubble with this junction. And of course, if this force was larger than that, it would just drag this junction all the way across it. And you'd end up with a swimming pool with a, a very thin sheen of gasoline acting on it. So the mechanism by which that would happen, or by which it would exist as a lens, is in the, the magnitudes, relative magnitudes of all these interfacial tensions. So, and you could calculate that. It's not super interesting to us, but it's how that would work. If you take that the next step and you drain the swimming pool and you put something on the bottom of the swimming pool, which is also gasoline, it's now a solid, so it doesn't matter whether the liquid is denser or less dense than water, it's always going to be supported by the pool liner and it has a gas above it, which is the air we're breathing. And you can do the same kind of analysis. Uh, we ignored the fact that these would have an angle to them. Maybe if the angle's small, so instead of having the angle this, in the limit, as the angle goes to zero, it will not have cosines and sines in here. Uh, likewise for this, as this angle goes to a very small angle, we don't have to worry about that. And so in this particular case, we could do the same kind of analysis, that the magnitude of this force as equal to uh, SG minus SL. So these are the other two forces. This is just the force balance equation that comes from the, and of course the component of this force in this direction, sigma gas liquid cosine theta. And the vertical component, which we don't care about, would be sine theta. And so again, we could look at how this angle here would be controlled by the relative magnitudes of these uh, interfacial uh, tensions, which are properties of the fluid in contact with the solid. So this would be the property of the gas in contact with the liquid. This would be a property of the liquid in contact with the solid. And this would be a property of the gas in contact with the solid, which are all parameters we can define. And so if we knew what these individual magnitudes for these are, we could come back and we could figure out exactly what this interfacial angle is. And this is quite important for us. This is the characteristic that we'd like to pull out of this equation. And the idea is that this controls exactly what we'll call, call the, uh, the wettability. So you could imagine that if this liquid L is uh, is hydro is is loves this um, uh, surface philic the Greek for, for love I guess right um, uh, or attracted to perhaps rather than love uh, <laughs> we're not doing Tinder here um, so the the uh, connection with this is uh, um, with this uh, lens which will sit here and if it's the contact angle is smaller than 90 degrees. This will tend to spread over to the left-hand side and be a, a thin layer. Uh, 
If it's more than this, you could imagine that if this was a, a bead of water uh, or liquid and looked like this as a bubble, so if you imagine this as being a bubble, a bead that's sitting on the surface, then now all of a sudden this interfacial angle theta is actually bigger than 90 degrees. This obviously is 90 degrees. This is zero degrees, and this is 180. So this is, I don't know, 135 degrees, something like that. And so the importance of this is this, this, this controls the behavior of the non-aqueous fluid in contact with a surface. And this surface is going to be our porous medium, the, the, the grains that we have in our porous medium. And so the definition of this is that if the angle here um, is less than 90 degrees, then we say that the liquid L wets the solid. It's a, it's a wetting liquid in that it wants to run all the way over the top of it and create a very thin monolayer. If the, the uh, wetting angle is more than 90 degrees, then the L is, I think this is wrong, L is non-wetting. Wetting. And if it's 90, it's neutral. And so the manifestation of this that you can think of that you've probably seen in your past, I, well, I guess the man, one manifestation is a bead of water sitting on a windshield. Typically, if you, when rain starts, you'll have drops of rain on your windshield, and they will look like... And they will look like this. But after you push your windshield wipers over them, then they will tend to, uh, first of all, maybe look like this, and then finally be just covering the window, just as a, a thin sheen. So initially, before you put your windshield wipers on, perhaps the water doesn't wet the window because it's non-wetting. But as you've scraped it across and pre-wet the window, then it will travel over it as a, as a single layer. And so the definitions of this are as we've given in terms of the wetting angle. And the manifestation that you can imagine for this is that if you put a capillary tube into water, a glass capillary tube into water, then what will happen is the water level will be down here, and water will rise in that capillary by some amount. If you put that capillary tube into mercury, then that capillary tube will look like this, and the, the level of the mercury will be up here, the opposite of each other. This is H2O. So capillary, water wet, it rises. If it's water non-wet, and this was water, the characteristics of if this surface, if it was non-wetting, um, glass happens to be non-wetting to, to mercury. But if it was another component like carbonates, in, like calcium carbonate in carbonate rocks, which is non-wetting, then this could also be water, and it would have the same behavior. If this is water, and this was calcium carbonate, CO3 is it, then this would be the behavior you'd see. And it's epitomized in the fact that as you measure the contact angle, contact angle here is this, and it's measured as this angle here. This is 90 degrees, so this is something like 135. And so the other point up here is, as it said, by convention, the wetting angle is always measured in a denser fluid, liquid in this case. So it's measured from this interface. So, so that's the first step that we want to understand. So how, what's the practical implications of that? The practical implications of this are that if you have a, a reservoir, that and these concepts really developed in petroleum reservoirs. I don't know why this won't get bigger. It doesn't want to. 
So a lot of this stuff, um, the literature on multi-phase flow is developed in the petroleum literature, where you want to get oil from a reservoir where the oil originally exists. You want that oil, if it's a viable reservoir, to be there, maybe filling 90% of the void space. So the saturation of oil is 90%. The saturation of water is 10, from what we've talked about already. And so as initially, as you go into the reservoir, if the grains are these stippled parts, um, the oil is the black, probably appropriate, and the white that you can probably barely see is the water, then the initial saturation would be the saturation of oil would be 90%. Saturation of water, maybe 10%. Could be a decimal as well. And that's what this is. And if you want to get the oil out of the system, could be us wanting to get the napple out of the system to re remediate it, then we want to get to the place where the oil might be 10% probably can't get it that low, and the water is 90%. We can't just suck the oil out, we have to replace it with something. So typically you can think about it as pumping water in and hoping to get the oil out of it, which is essentially how it works. Um, and so we can think about changing the saturations. And so the behavior that we see here is important in understanding what goes on. You have this in your notes in words, but I'll, I won't go to those words. I'll do it in my words. I won't use the, the written narrative. I'll use the spoken narrative. So this starts with what we will call pendular saturation. Of the water. And so if you imagine this in 3D, you can imagine these grains contacting each other. You can imagine that the water exists in here. We've already said that the water is, uh, the quartz is hydrophilic. The quartz loves the water, or the water loves the quartz. I'm not sure which one to say. And so around this quartz grain, you have a single molecular layer thickness of water, which completely covers this grain. And also, within the little triangular spots here, there's a pendular ring of water. So you could imagine that if you take two grains on grains, actually a bit later on, then I think I have a picture of it. If you imagine two grains on grains, you'd imagine that the, uh, if the water, this is written the opposite way, if you imagine the water being outside here, and the air, no, that's not, I guess that's right, it's exactly right. The water exists here as pendular rings. So you can think of this as a donut that goes around the contacts. It has a curvature both in the circle that goes around the grains and also in the curvature of this circle here, both driven by interfacial contact. And so in a general sense, this has um, what's called pendular saturation. And so now if you sucked on this to pull out the oil, uh, if you could do that, then the oil is in a continuous phase and you'd be able to pull it out. And of course you can't choose whether you suck out just the oil or the water, you, all you do is suck. And so you'd expect to get perhaps both fluids, but you don't because the water is attached by interfacial tension. And most importantly, the water isn't continuous. So to go from this little bead of water here which is attached to this bead here, because it's a ring, it's not attached to this little bead of water here, which is attached to this one here. These are continuous, these are continuous, but it's not continuous across the porous medium. So pendular saturation, if you withdraw the fluid, you'll only get oil out of it. If you get enough oil out of it, you have to replace it with something. You replace it with water. So you'd expect the oil to start being bubbles in the middle of these pores. These pendular rings that you have here now get bigger. And as you keep on going, these bubbles get to be the opposite of the case before. Before this was a connected phase. This phase was connected, the black was connected to the black across it. Now the black is no longer connected, but the, the white is. And so you've changed the saturation, and this is called funicular saturation. This is the question I got wrong on the quiz yesterday, by the way. 
And this means, well, funicular is a funicular railway. I'm not sure what the etymology of the word is, but uh, funicular railway is a cog railway where it has to be carried up the slope by some mechanism. So this just means that to get this bubble of oil out, you've got to physically transport it on the water. And actually, you'd think that to transport on the water, the only way you can do that would be by getting the water flowing very quickly around it and creating some kind of viscous drag around it. If you remember coefficients of drag and drag forces. And the reality is you can't get a very big drag force to do it, and you can't physically do that. So the reality is, bad for oil reservoirs. You can't get all the petroleum out of it. Lots of it will uh, stay in there. So you might not end up with as little as 10%. You might end up with 50%. And bad news for groundwater remediation is you'll probably end up with a large amount in there as well, which you can't clean it out. And so this is important for us to understand. So we go from one saturation to another. If instead of being water wet quartz, we were oil wet carbonate, say. So still the same two fluids, but just a different surface which the fluids are on, then the opposite is true. The carbonate loves the oil, the oil forms a pendular saturation around the grains and the water exists in isolation or in connection in these big globs. The water phase is connected, you suck the water out in this, or you suck the fluid out in this case, water comes out. Uh, if you replaced it with water, fine, it would still be water, nothing would change. If you replaced it with oil, you'd get the opposite component. And so that's all we need to understand about that. And so the narrative in talking about that is up there, but hopefully it's not too complex to understand that. So we can understand that the interaction between the fluids, two fluids, and the, the solid is important in understanding what happens. Uh, we haven't said anything about the, the forces or the pressures that we'd have to apply to do that. But one way for us to think about that is in terms of capillary pressures. I don't know whether you saw this. Uh, it doesn't do it unless I go to this. Do, I don't know if we used this in 303. For your viewing pleasure. <laughs> the venometer. Did we? So when you're out on Thirsty Thursday and you want to see what the alcohol content is of your beer, uh, or if you're with friends and of course you can't drink because you're still 20, you can put it in a venometer. Venometer the is just something that gives you the alcohol content of liquids. And so what you do is you put the liquid in here, can't by water, I put it in. It fills up this little um, capsule at the top. This is a capri tube, which has, you can see the, the hole through it, which comes out of the bottom. You blow until water comes out of the bottom. So you fill up this capri tube and then you stand it upside down. You stand it upside down, and now this is open, and you can look within this tube, it's graduated on the side, to give you the alcohol content, which is the height to which this will stand up within this tube. And so it's really controlled by the surface tension, which would be across the top of this tube, open at the bottom here, which is at atmospheric pressure. And so it's a direct analog to the system that we'll look at right now. Right now. This is the background. Of course, beer and wine are just are miscible, right? The alcohol is miscible with the water. Uh, so beer's three, if you have bad beer, to 11% these days. Wine's 12 to 15. Liquor, 50%, perhaps? Am I not supposed to be saying this stuff here? Not tainting young minds? <laughs> so it's miscible. But, but we're talking about the the fact that in this we have two, two fluids. We have air, which is one fluid. We have water or an apple, which is one fluid, uh, liquid in this particular case. And we can look at this behavior. You know how this works. You cut off the bottom of this because you know that this is atmospheric pressure here. That means this must be atmospheric pressure here. So you can cut it off and lift up this cylinder. If you lift up this cylinder, 
then you merely do a force balance. I love the, my skill with this, that you have this isolated cylinder, which is this height here, and ignore the curvature, and we pull it up with a, a circumferential force on this boundary here, which is the surface tension times the circumference, and the weight acting downwards is the uh, equals the volume times the density of water times gravity, right? And this is just uh, 2 pi r times surface tension, which is F surface tension. So if we put these together, if we wanted to, we could have an angle on this. It may be important in some things, but let's ignore it for now. If we do that, we end up with a magic equation, which is this. The height rise is given by four times the interfacial tension, a physical property of the fluid in contact with the quartz uh, glass, the diameter of the capillary and the unit weight of the fluid, and of course the unit weight is just equal to the density times gravity. In this particular case, maybe water, but not necessarily water. We know that um, pressure uh, is equal, pressure time divided by unit weight is equal to a height, hydraulic head, by definition. Turns out to be more convenient for us to use the, the concept of the difference in pressures between the pressure in the gas and the pressure in the water. As we go across this surface, if we draw points immediately above and below that surface, we'd actually find that there are different pressures. This is what we'll call the pressure, capillary pressure, which is different between, which is the difference between the pressure of the wetting fluid, which would be the one in the water, and the non-wetting fluid, which would be one in air, in this particular case, NW. And the difference between those is shown by this curvature of the surface. The more curved this surface is, the larger that difference is, as it turns out. And so we could look at this capillary pressure. And of course, if we know what capillary pressure is, um, we could merely write that capillary pressure. We could divide that capillary pressure in terms of unit weight of a fluid, divide both sides by the unit weight maybe of water, in which case we have the differences between these. And without going into the math, this is basically what this height is. So this height that's defined here is the pressure difference between this height uh, change so if this is atmospheric pressure here, you know that as you go up to here, you must be getting more tensile because you're applying these forces to lift up this block of fluid against itself. So the pressure under here is going to be a negative relative to atmospheric pressure, which is zero. And so this is given by this. A bit, a bit, maybe a bit rushed. And so what you can think of is that this pressure differential as the tube gets smaller, this curvature gets more arcuate and the tighter radius, and the, the head rise is also becomes larger, which means that the capillary pressure becomes larger because it's related to this height rise. And what you can think of that is as it takes more pressure differential to be able to push a bead of this non-aqueous fluid through the capillary, and that capillary, of course, is analogous to um, the porous medium. And so the, the stretch that we're going to do is that we're going to think of our porous medium as a whole bunch of grains that look like this. I haven't even changed color yet. And if you think about the holes between these, these are the pores that we have. Maybe you can think of these pores as being little capillary tubes. And these capillary tubes are of some diameter, lowercase d. And if we think about that in terms of this, then the ability for us to pu push a bubble of this liquid along the tube, it could be water if it's a dry tube that we're trying to force in it, or it could be these non-aqueous phase liquids that we're talking about as well. 
then we can use this Capri rise height as an index to how much force we, we have to apply. So we realize that the difference between these pressures, the so-called capillary pressure, is uh, equal to the height rise multiplied by the unit weight of one of the fluids. And it's a bit ambiguous as to what that fluid could be. It makes a difference, right? Because that fluid could be water or it could be the air. And the only important thing to pull out of this is it's the capillary pressure is proportional to the interfacial tension and it's inversely proportional to the diameter. So to get to make a bigger pressure to resist against getting that bubble in there, we can either use a bigger interfacial tension or a smaller diameter tube, which seems to make. And that kind of is the essence of our capillary barrier in that a capillary barrier resists flow going across it or invasion by the other fluid if the diameter of the pores are smaller. And of course, that is exactly what we saw before when we looked at this particular picture here. So I don't know whether you can see it properly or not. The pore sizes in the top are, the grain sizes are big, and therefore the pores geometrically have to be big as well. The grains are small here, so the pores geometrically just by trigonometry had to be small. And so that presumably is the reason that it stopped the stuff going. The capillary pressure resisting it, invading this lower part is too big for most of it, except for a few places where perhaps it's open enough that it can get it just by the, random, the randomness of the packing within the system. And so that really governs the behavior that we're talking about. So that's the essence of what we're talking about today. So, uh, that's one way to look at it. The other way, which we won't use very much, is to look at it in terms of grain on grains. So instead of looking at it as a bunch of grains with holes between them, which we can force the fluid through, we can actually get a pretty similar result by think, idealizing it in a different way, and that is to, to think of it grain on grain. And in this particular case, where we have two phases present, we have water. If the water is, uh, if the grains are hydrophilic, the water will be attached to them. It'll be present as a pendant saturation, and it will go around as a donut in this contact, and it will have two curvatures. The donut curvature, looking down in plan view on top of this, will be some radius. And I can't remember which of these radii, well, it's this one. And the other radius is the radius of curvature on this side, which is our single prime versus our double prime. And it turns out that we can, if we want to use that, we can also write this capillary pressure. We could think of this as a capillary pressure. I guess I didn't need to do that because it's defined here. As the pressures due to these two curvatures. I already said that on this um, surface here, the difference between the two pressures in the gas and the liquid are controlled by this curvature. The, more, the smaller the radius of curvature, the tighter the radius of curvature, the bigger the pressure. If you have two radii of curvature, you'd expect that you perhaps had two effects. And so the capillary pressure can be defined also in terms of these two radii of curvature. Uh, we won't use it so much in this class. We'll use the previous one much more, but it just as another way of characterizing exactly what the porous medium looks like. And the significance of this in our parting shot is that if you think about a porous medium where you have a capillary, but it varies in diameter as you go along the flow path, kind of like the red picture we looked at, there must be a reason why these little ganglia have invaded the, the small grains in some places, but not everywhere. And you could imagine that it's because it's finding open pores. So if, if it finds an open pore and you flip this 90 degrees so the stuff is going downhill, not sideways, then you could imagine that it would be happy to go down the big capillaries, but it might get hung up on the little 
And so understanding exactly what the distribution of these capillary tubes might be important to us, uh, both whether they exist as fractures. We saw in the Dean Apple picture, these fractures were superhighways, and you can imagine that being a superhighway and the stuff not going into the porous media around it because the capillary diameters are too small. Or in a porous medium, you can think about it going into the, the pores, but those pores have to squeeze through a narrow pore throat, and if that pore throat is too small, you'd think it might catch the, the fluid as it goes through there, and it won't go any further. And so what we're talking about when we're looking at these systems is what happens and I won't do the last thing that I was going to do today because uh, we're getting short on time. We're trying to understand exactly what happens in these systems. And so we can imagine that the mechanism by which it stops here is the red fluid being stopped at the small beads below it by some small diameter pore space and also low permeability material as it happens to be. But the mechanism by which it's stopped is by the size of the pore spaces. And we could imagine that as it also has transited this uh, porous media in the Vedo zone, we'd also imagine that within the Vedo zone, maybe the, the saturation would look a bit like this Laplace equation. The grains are coated in fluid, only the, pore, the, the grain contacts. The rest of it is air inside here. If we have a Dean, an apple coming through here, what's it going to do? Well, some of it's going to get caught on the, on the, um, on the, uh, the, por the uh, grain surfaces and caught here. And so truly within this, we will have three phases. We'll have water, which hasn't been displaced by the apple going down through it. We'll have air, which has to relinquish some of its territory, because if the Dean apple is squeezing down through here, it's has to push the air apart because the saturation of those three fluids can only be 100%. So the only one that can go down if you're putting in more NAPL is the saturation of air. And you could imagine that if the NAPL really loves the, uh, likes the uh, grains to some degree as well, it will be smeared on here and it will leave this important residual chimney which is partly water, partly napple, and partly air. And that's going to be important to understand what this system is in the first month in which it goes through there. And the reality is, although we don't know that yet, is that once it gets into this configuration, it's really tough to get out of it because interfacial forces are quite large compared to the other forces that we can apply. And I will remember to ask questions. Are there any questions?